Hi there. Hello. Good. good morning. Good morning. I think I clicked the wrong link. Apologies. It's okay. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I don't know. Where are you located? Uh, upstate New York. Oh, okay. So it's later there. It's not super early. No, no. Yep. Well, we are so excited to talk with you today. We've been looking forward to this, and I think it's going to be of huge value to our community. Um, We are recording today, so if anyone has to leave or jump off, we're going to be sending out the link to the recorded version to our email list so everyone can get some great information. Um, Where should we get started? Natalie, do you want to introduce our guest speaker, and then we can kind of kick it off? Yeah, I think I'd actually love for Sarah to introduce herself. I think she's going to do a much better job than <laughs> than either of us could. Um, so we'll kind of have you give a brief introduction, and then we'll jump right in. I have um, where I know where I would like to start the conversation at, which is one of your pinned, uh, your top pinned tweets. So um, why don't you go ahead and share share a little bit about yourself for everyone, and then we'll dive right into the conversation. Okay, sounds great. Yep. So my name is Sarah Place. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer with Alanco Animal Health. I've been with the company for about uh, two and a half years. Uh, before that was with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, um, running the sustainability research program on behalf of the, the beef checkoff. And then prior to that was on faculty at Oklahoma State University for about four years with a teaching and research appointment, uh, really focusing on measuring methane emissions from cattle um, and teaching courses in animal science. Um, so I got a PhD in animal biology from University of California, Davis, um, and my bachelor's degree in animal science from uh, Cornell University, and then a, an ag business degree from a, a local uh, junior college here in, in New York State called Morrisville State College. And that is where I'm based is in New York State, work from home. Uh, and again, uh, happy to be here uh, this, this morning. Thanks, you guys, for, for inviting me. Wow. That was quite the journey of college experience. It was like coast <laughs> to coast. You just, you wanted to make sure you got both coasts in there. Yeah. I joke in all time zones of the U S except for Alaska, Hawaii. So I'm, I'm looking, looking for, uh, positions, if you will. No, I'm just kidding. But, yeah. Yeah. I was going to be like, and that is what we call an expert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of that is an expert in this area. <laughs> and why we're so, again, so thankful to have you on. Um, so I would say your largest, I know you're probably like on LinkedIn and a couple other things, but I know you're not on Instagram. I'm not sure about Facebook, but I would say you're really, really present on Twitter. That is where I follow you. That is where I consume most of your content. Um, and you you have a, one of your, I think it's maybe, I don't know how many you can pin, but I know it's one of your top top tweets that you pin that's um, the discussions of beyond like moving beyond carbon footprints and kind of encompassing everything that goes into sustainability. And that is kind of where I would like to start this discussion because they don't feel like that is, it's a huge part of the puzzle and no one is having conversation on those other pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that uh, pin tweet, if you will, that it's kind of a representative of how I usually start most of my presentations when it comes to sustainability, which is that the topic itself is huge and all encompassing. And it's fairly easy for us to get basically wrapped around the axle with focusing on one thing, right, or one metric, and we can miss the bigger picture when we do that. Um, and and to that end, right, sustainability is about you know it's about the economics of a system, the social acceptability of a system, and the environmental performance, if you will, and trying to balance all three of those areas at the same time and do it for the long term, right? Which is kind of an impossible task. And that's actually one of the main points is that this is an issue that will never be solved. It's only about being managed, right? Trying to get better over time. Um, And the reality that so much of this discussion is not objective, right? Uh, As a scientist, I love data and having the the actual numbers to back up any claims that we're making. Um, But we also need to acknowledge the reality is that so much of this discussion about sustainability is actually about value judgments and about questions of what should we be doing, right? How should we be growing food? What should we be eating? And when we enter into questions of using the word should, I always say like we've departed the land of objectivity, right? It is it is more messy and it is more about like ethics and morals and all those things um, wrapped up together. And that's what can make some of these discussions about sustainability so seemingly difficult or Um, If anybody's ever had those conversations with folks that have strong opinions about food, which is most everyone, we all eat, uh, it, you know, you, you seem to address one issue and then you get another one, right? It's kind of a game of whack-a-mole of, well, what about, well, what about, right? Um, Those type of questions after you address one thing. 
Yeah. This tweet of yours, one of the reasons I love it is I've been looking a lot at instead of comparing like a gallon of almond milk to a gallon of cow's milk, which is what traditionally, like you see online is like comparing, um, a the protein content, like how, what is the footprint per gram of protein? And then it changes the entire like dynamics of what the impact is. You know, it, it just, we're constantly comparing, I feel like, you know, apples to oranges, or like, I like to say apples to steak. Like it's not a, it's not a, a like an accurate comparison. And the system is so much more complicated, I think, than people like it to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. So yeah, there's a couple of things there, right? And I, I think in that tweet, I've, I've always mentioned, right? Greenhouse gas emissions per calorie, which is oftentimes what will come up. Um, and in that type of metric, right, to be clear, like what we would call animal source foods, whether it's dairy or meat or eggs or whatever it may be, will always probably look quote unquote worse than plant-based foods because of just the reality of that metric, right? You, you, when you feed plants to animals, you will lose energy as those animals use the plant's energy for their own metabolism. But what we miss in that kind of metric is the fact that, you know, we're not consuming dairy or any of these other foods for just the calories, right? It's because they're nutrient dense. It's because one, they're tasty, <laughs> the cultural relevance of these foods, right? And so that's, that's where we can, we can run into trouble if we just focus on, for example, calories, and especially in today's environment in countries like the United States, where just calories available is actually a pretty poor indication of nutritional adequacy for people, right? If that makes sense. We, we really do need to think about what we call nutrient density, which is all those different uh, micronutrients and macronutrients expressed as how available they are to people. And that's really where animal source foods can shine in a part of an omnivorous diet, which most, most people are, right? So can we continue in on that? Maybe can you, I don't know if this is even possible. It's putting you on the spot a little bit, but can you, I mean, what are some key points uh, we as producers could bring into that conversation to kind of expand to that? That is something I get all the time. That's like, it's exactly what we're saying. These are huge, vast concepts. This is not black and white. It's like an inner web of information and emotions and all of these things. And so I always get asked, like, what do I actually share? Like, how can I have a good conversation? Um, and so I'm wondering if there's anything talking about like the, that diet portion, you know, taking into, you had also mentioned, like when we go to the worldwide, like the economic portion of beef, like, can you kind of, I don't know. I mean, yeah. as best as you can put that into something nice and little for our listeners. <laughs> yeah. Key points yeah. Of that. yeah. Wrap that in a lovely little present. Yeah. 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 Get back to us. <laughs> yeah. It can be hard to boil it down for sure. But I think, so you brought up almond milk and I think one other way to talk about this is, as you said, right, like it's interconnected and maybe one way to bring it back to folks is that that reality of like, as you're walking through a grocery store in the US and we're, we're so lucky to have the abundance of food that we do and all the variety, right? But there's so many great examples of how different foodstuffs on the shelf are connected in the supply chain and how important animal agriculture is to make even plant-based foods more sustainable. And I think almond milk is such a great example of that is it's, you know, some folks will push it as a, a dairy alternative. And the reality is, is of course, there's a lot of dairy farmers in California that own almond grows, right? Um, and the reality that if we think about the byproducts that come from almond production, one of those key ones is almond holes. And where do almond holes end up? Uh, dairy cow diets, right? So that's the grand irony of that is that actually even in the production of almonds and almond milk, there are parts of the plant that we of course can't consume. And that's where ruminant animals like cattle really shine because they take that would be waste and they upcycle it or make a higher value product in the form of milk. Um, and so there's so many examples where you can look at that. I always think that's a, a great example of almond milk plus, you know, real milk and, uh, and then thinking about also like orange juice, right, in the state of California and all the citrus groves there and the citrus pulp that gets produced, right? Um, and that goes into dairy cow diets too, right? So people may not think when they pick up orange juice, pick up their OJ, that it's somehow connected also uh, to the dairy case, but it is, right? Um, same thing with cotton, um, you know, brewer's grains to cattle, uh, your beer and your beef being connected, right? So there's so many examples there. And I think that's a great example of why sometimes the way things are framed, right? Well, we should eat only a plant-based diet, only plants, not animal products. Um, I think the key thing for me is a lot of these sustainability discussions is almost sometimes 
it's not like answering a question with a question, but it sometimes is of basically the premise of how some of these things are being framed in the broader discussion is just, in my opinion, just really short-sighted, right? And kind of the wrong questions we should be asking, if that makes sense. Um, I'm really glad you brought up the almond milk thing because I am so passionate that it's not an us versus them thing. Like even as a dairy farmer who doesn't grow almonds, like it's not an us versus them. It's about a system that works together collectively. And actually our interviewer last week, um, was an economist. I don't know if I said that right. Yeah. Uh, he was talking about ethanol and like ethanol, you know, as cattle producers, we get really nervous with more ethanol production, but he was like, now there's going to be more byproducts from ethanol that you'll feed your cattle. Like it all works together into a system and, um, makes it all more sustainable. Like ethanol wouldn't be as sustainable if we weren't feeding the byproducts to cows, like every bit of it has to work together. And I think cattle play a big part in that, that people just do not see. So I love those examples you used of being very basic of like, this ends up on your plate, but this also ends up on cow's plates. Like it's connected. Yep. Yep, It is. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate because I feel like, I don't know how, but I've missed even having this discussion with a lot of my, like my, my fingers are itching right now to like go to my community and bring this back. Like, I'm just dying to start bringing this into the conversation more. I don't know how this has gone over my head, but I've, I think as a lot of producers, no one is having this, that very important part of the conversation. I think like broad, I just, I don't know. I, I like selfishly don't want to be conducting the interview of this. I actually want to just sit back and take notes. So Tara, you feel free <laughs> to just carry on. I'm going to selfishly just take notes over here. Yeah. Okay. I, I will carry on the conversation. <laughs> so, um, on that note, um, I feel like you still had something more to say. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Well, yeah, you asked such a big question, right? <laughs> so we could go on forever, but I think the, uh, I think the other thing is, is the nutrition side. So I, I get passionate about that just because I think it is important in, in this holistic kind of view of things of like, why did we domesticate animals in the first place? Right. And it kind of comes back to this the stuff that we were just talking about of all these byproducts. Um, You know, that is one of the key roles that livestock in general play is taking these byproducts and just basically plants that are human inedible and making higher value products for us. And a lot of it, of course, is food, but it's also beyond food, right? What livestock provide is, you know, fertilizer in the form of manure and not just fertilizer, but basically recycling nutrients through the system. Right. So again, we we fertilize our crops, we put nitrogen and phosphorus on those crops, some of it gets taken up by plants. And when those animals eat those those crops, right, it's not 100 percent efficient. They they right excrete some of those nutrients back out. And the beauty of livestock is that it's, it's almost like this cycle, right, of we're just these nutrient loops where we're capturing some of it, using it in human society, and then the rest can be returned back to the landscape. Right. Um, and that's, that's, what's super cool from that perspective, the nutrition piece fits into that because again, what, what these animals, especially ruminants are doing is basically unlocking solar energy is the, <laughs> the way I like to put it. Right. So most of what, uh, beef and dairy cattle consume is human inedible material. And a lot of that is just caught up in fiber that we feed animals, right? So the fibrous parts of plants, uh, and, you know, if you think about it from an animal nutrition perspective, right, the NDF, the nu- neutral detergent fiber, uh, the stuff that cannot be broken down. And so the, the main constituent um, in these animals diets really is tends to be cellulose, which is the most abundant organic molecule on planet Earth, organic meaning carbon containing. That's where most of the solar energy gets captured. And yet human beings, we cannot break it down right in our guts. Um, And ruminant animals are super unique because they have this symbiotic relationship with all the microbes that live in their stomach. And those microbes can break this molecule down, right? So that's another way to think about it when, whether these animals are eating almond holes or citrus pulp, which are two high fiber, high cellulose feedstuffs, or if you see cattle out grazing on the landscape, what are those critters really doing? They're taking solar energy that is totally outside of the human food supply and they are unlocking it, right? Uh, for for human use. So that's super cool is, uh, again, they're they're solar powered, right? And they're and they're unlocking that solar energy in ways that we wouldn't have access to otherwise. So um, just one of those things of, again, that that feeds into the nutrition piece, because now they're they're using that energy to make uh, high quality uh, protein that's available to us and not just the protein, but all the essential micronutrients that are in beef and dairy products, too. 
So continuing on this, can we start, can you, cause I feel like uh, this flows well next. Um, I mean, you highlighted basically the power of upcycling. Um, can you also bring in the conversation about arable versus non-arable land and how that, and just like continue that conversation of, of there, not only are they upcycling, but how we're using land that couldn't be used for anything else too. Yeah. 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 So that's a great, great point, right? So it, it, both of those things kind of fall into this idea of like one of the main critiques of animal agriculture is that there's feed food competition, right? Meaning that animal feed and human food are competing and that we could feed more people or feed people better if we didn't have animal agriculture. And so, yeah, the direct competition piece is kind of addressed by all this upcycling talk and like the reality that most of what cattle eat is not in direct competition with human food. The next question people ask is like, well, what about what about all the land, right? Couldn't we use that land and put it to better use, to your point, Natalie? And um, when we think about the, the beef cattle industry in particular, the vast, vast majority of land, right? Somewhere 90 plus percent of it that is quote unquote used or occupied by beef cattle in the United States is pasture and rangeland, right? Um, rangeland being lands that are too arid, too rocky, too steep for us to actually cultivate, right? Or if we did, uh, would usually require a lot of irrigation water and potentially highly erodible soils, right? So as I sit here in New York State, uh, there's still a lot of grazing happening here just because a lot of the rolling hills and everything else in, in this part of the country, you can definitely plow them if you want, but then, you know, there goes your topsoil, right? So that's one of the beauties of, again, cattle is that we're able to um, really use them to help with those, uh, executing those key principles of soil health, right? Which a lot of it is keep the ground covered, keep a living root in the soil as long as possible, right? Um, and that that really helps from a standpoint of retaining as much soil as we can, as much water as we can, getting better soil, water infiltration. All those things are super, super important, um, especially going forward as we have more of a changing climate, right? This will actually just even be more important to have these type of landscapes where animals are occupying them. Um, you mentioned irrigation, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, one of the things that I always see is, well, beef uses so much water, and there's just different types of water that people, that we have to better communicate, like the differences between blue water and green water. Um, can you share on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So that's always one of those things that at first, when you say like blue water and green water, people are like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so when we take a step back, if we think about like a water footprint, a water footprint is water use per unit of production, right? So in the case of beef, maybe per pound of beef that gets produced. Um, but to your point, there are different types of water that can be used. So blue water is defined really as um, surface and groundwater. So if you're pumping water out of a well or you're using surface water from a reservoir, right, to irrigate, that would be included in blue water use. And then green water is any sort of precipitation, rainfall, snowfall, whatever it may be, uh, that gets used on the landscape. And so this is one of those tricky things. So sometimes the really high numbers that you'll see quoted, I think one of the highest numbers out there is like 25,000 gallons of water per pound of beef. Um, if you do the math on that, like that's literally like a third of all the precipitation in the United States of America just being allocated to beef cattle production. Just coming back to the, the prior point, right? Like all the range land in the US, all the rain and snow that falls on that land, basically saying, well, that's all the water use for beef, right? So hopefully that makes sense. That's kind of a little bit tricky, right? That's gonna happen. <laughs> the water is going to land on that landscape, whether there's a bovine on it or not, right? Um, and, and water use is, is um, it, it is a concern, right? Across agriculture, because agriculture is a main user of water and, and doing a good job with water co conservation is important, um, but it's super localized in terms of the issue and the context and the idea of, are we using water at rates that are unsustainable for the given, right, aquifer region? Um, or are you in a place like, again, where I'm at in upstate New York, where usually our problem is we have too much water all the time, right? So it's super localized in terms of where you are and what the main issues are. Okay, staying on this before. <laughs> Before we move, I did this with uh, Dr. Mitloner too. I was like, okay, we can't, I, I got to keep on this conversation. Uh, <laughs> I would not let him move on to other points at some point of our conversation. But I do want to talk about like stepping back from a macro standpoint. If we were to look at what it would actually be like, so we've talked about all of these important things that cattle right now do, right? So they're interwebbed with like upcycling, eating inedible, 
they are connected to other food sources. Um, what can you talk about what it would actually look like if we removed cattle? Is that even possible? Like contextualize that a little bit for people that are arguing to remove animals and then paint the picture. If you can, what that does to our diets, to the landscape, like what does removing cattle actually that impact look like? If you can, I don't even know if that's like a plausible thing to explain. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's difficult because there are there are some studies out there that try to look at this, but at the same time, there are things even beyond, like I briefly mentioned that, right, beyond food that are hard to account for, right? And I'll just list those real quick, right? If we think about even in the developing parts of the world, cattle are so important for draft power, manure is used for fuel, uh, even in across the world pharmaceuticals that come from livestock are incredibly important, right? There's a lot of people walking around with heart valves that actually come from the pericardium of cattle, right? So that's a <laughs> that's a byproduct that's rather rather important, right, for human life. So anyways, all those different uses beyond food. But if we're to, to kind of narrow in on your question, there was a study that was done a few years ago that had a very US specific focus and was not just about cattle, but really all livestock, right? Um, these two scientists published this in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, and looked at a scenario that is completely unrealistic, but I think it's a great way to put like an upper bound on what is possible in terms of what if we got rid of all livestock in the United States? What would that do to the food supply? But then also what would it do to greenhouse gas emissions? Because that's often where um, this conversation is coming from is the idea if we can shift diets or we can change things, we can significantly cut greenhouse gas emissions. So a little bit of context there. If you look at the EPA data, um, that, that comes out every April, about 4% of US greenhouse gas emissions directly come from animal ag. And I use the word directly, that means like all the methane that cattle belch out, methane from manure, nitrous oxide from manure. Okay, that's the direct emissions from livestock. So these two scientists, they did the study, um, they said, well, if we remove all livestock in the United States, we would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2.6 percentage points which if it's 4%, why would it only be 2.6% reduction, right? And this is part of, as this conversation we were just having, the interplay between animal ag and the rest of agriculture, right? So as they did this scenario analysis, they, they came to the realization, right? Like, well, if we get rid of livestock, we get rid of this nutrient recycling service, basically that livestock provide us, providing manure back to the soil. So that means that we have to use more synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, and there's a greenhouse gas emission cost of that, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to emit more nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, so there's two sides of that. One, we have to use more synthetic fertilizer. And the second thing would be, we actually are going to have to grow more legumes uh, for the nitrogen credits in the soil, but also because we're going to have to eat a lot more legumes <laughs> to meet our protein requirements as people, right? So whether that's lentils or beans, whatever it may be, right? So those are a big part of it. Um, they, they just made the assumption that like all the byproducts are probably just going to have to get incinerated, right? Or we're going to have to do something with them, um, which is significant in terms of there's a lot of, again, a lot of material from almond hull, citrus pulp, cotton seed, everything else that would just have to find an alternative home, right? Um, so yeah, 2.6 percentage points. And that's if literally every animal goes away, which is another key point of this, right? All the cattle, all the hogs, all the poultry species have to go poof, right? I always joke it like, I mean, we had to have one final barbecue and then that's it, right? Like there's no more animals. And that's, that's key because um, the animals themselves have to not exist, right? For the actual quote unquote benefit of the greenhouse gas emission reduction. The other side of the coin of that study is they looked at what are the implications for the nutrient supply um, in the US um, and they did find almost uh, related to the earlier part of this conversation, right? You would actually produce more calories if you had no livestock in the system because you would just be eating plants and we would have a lot more calories available. Um, the reality is, is probably in America, we don't need more calories, right? Um, the calorie supply itself would be less nutrient dense though. And in some cases, things like vitamin B12, which is an essential micronutrient, we wouldn't have any of it in our food supply. So that's a really not good trade-off, right? Of this 2.6% reduction. So a long way to put that is uh, there are significant trade-offs if you were to do something super dramatic, like get rid of all cattle or get rid of all livestock. 
Um, and again, that was all livestock. So if we get rid of all cattle, it would be a smaller percent reduction. And again, you'd have to think through, well, what are we going to do with all the grassland landscapes, right? We need, in a lot of cases, some sort of ruminant, ungulate grazing on that landscape, right? So if we put bison back on a landscape after we remove cattle, guess what, right? They emit methane too. So that would eat into our benefit of a greenhouse gas emission reduction. So all that to say, not to be discouraging <laughs> to people that want to try to do their part, right? And I think that's where a lot of this dietary change conversation is coming from, but it just doesn't amount to a lot if you shift your diet. Yeah. So my next question, well, I actually have a ton of questions. I'm like debating in my head where I want to take the conversation next. Um, so hopefully I remember my other points I want to bring up, but the one I want to bring up now then is because I struggle with this. I struggle with why it seems so apparent to all of us, right? Everyone in this conversation about how integral cattle are, how important, how interconnected this is. Why are other people missing that? And why, I mean, this is not a like scientific or it's more of like a person, I guess a personal opinion question for you, but I'm just interested to hear why you think people are either so resistant to that or unaware of it. Like, do we need to do a better job? Is it putting out information? I feel like we crank out information and people are still super like, no, no, no. Where's that fact from? Like, they're still so hesitant to believe the reality of the situation. And I cannot grasp and understand why. And I'm just, I just, I guess for people listening, what can we do better to make all of those like points that seem so obvious and important to us, obvious and important to, to the people that it's not. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is like anything in this world, uh, there's so much happening. Right. And so many people that are not living this day to day have so many other concerns and, and things that they're seeing. And, and the reality is, is that there's a lot of times where this comes up in the mainstream press and it gets very flattened and simplified, as we were saying earlier, it gets boiled down to, oh, cattle emit more emissions than uh, bean production or pea production. So just change your diet and people just grab onto that simple nugget. Right. Totally understandable. And I think we all do that in in other parts of our life. So. I think that's kind of maybe the unsatisfying answer is that it just takes a lot of repetition and opening those those uh, conversations up. Um, and I'm sure you guys have experienced that when you have one on one conversations with people like, oh, yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Right. Um, but it's just that the idea of how do you get that out to everyone? Right. And get that in a way that's easy to understand. Um, I think what works really well, right, is, you know, obviously video content, visuals, telling that story and just being authentic with people and you know, things don't have to be perfect. Everybody understands that, especially over the last couple of years, people get that uh, things aren't perfect, right? But this is why we we raise cattle um, and why, you know, folks like yourselves are doing such a good job, right? In terms of trying to take care of things and make things better. Um, and, and having people understand that, I think it's just, again, a, a matter of repetition. It's just being authentic and just showing, showing folks what actually is happening, right? For those that are interested. But for a lot of people, I think it's just the reality is, ah, they're busy and they have a lot else happening and they read a headline once and that just kind of lodged in their brain. And that's, you know, that's a human thing to have happen. Yeah. It's so easy to listen to one soundbite that says, if you stop eating meat, like we are, we'll solve like climate change. Um, and it's so hard to go back and re like, teach and explain and share and take all of, I mean, I always say like in one 140 character tweet, you can change someone's mind about their diet, like to not have meat, but it takes us like studies and researched peer reviewed documents to go back and like, and then trying to break that into multiple things that we can give people. Like it's just more complicated yeah. and they just want to cling to that really easy. Like if I change my diet, we will solve the climate issues. And so like to go back, I also, um, Natalie, do you care if I switch gears or you, okay. Um, to go back kind of to that is, I also think a lot of it is misinformation through our marketing, which, you know, follow kind of the money, which I know that's like a cliche thing to say, but it is kind of true. Like if people can use like fear-based marketing tactics and things to sell their product, they do. And I think like one of the examples I think of with that is like lab grown meat, like, oh, you still get all the benefits of meat. You get to have meat. And like talking about all the things that we've just talked about, it's obvious to me that lab grown meat does not solve all of those problems. Um, can you share on that a little bit of like the sustainability differences there of um, meat versus lab grown meat? Yeah, so there's obviously different categories when you think about quote unquote meat alternatives, right? Where we can think about the plant based products that already exist or already out there, and then so called lab grown or cultured products that are. 
basically trying to grow, right? Cell cultures, muscle, muscle cells, fat cells, um, outside of the animal in bioreactors, what other type systems they may use and market that. So just to be clear, right, those products do not exist for commercial sale in the United States. So <laughs> that's, that's one of the challenges I think with that, um, industry, I don't want to be, I don't want to be negative on them, but there's actually huge technical barriers for that, um, vision to become a reality. And I think it kind of comes back to some of the things that we were discussing earlier is sometimes these sustainability conversations are cast in that way. You can easily pick up a, you know, an economist article or something else and read about this fantastical future where we're all going to be eating lab grown meat. Sounds great. Um, and I think because, <clears throat> because we've all experienced the, the information technology revolution in the last 20 years, um, it can be easy to be like, well, of course that's going to happen, right? I mean, that's just human progress is how that works. Um, but I'll just say as an animal scientist that um, it's a lot easier to code software than to overcome biological realities. And I think that's where, that's where lab-grown meat is going to run into some, has and will continue to run into some issues. So to take a step back, just thinking about it, if you're going to grow the cell culture and try to grow uh, meat outside of the animal, you have to provide everything the animal already does, Right. You had to provide a temperature stable environment. You had to feed all the cells. You have to take away the waste products of the cells. You have to shock the cells out of senescence and get them to differentiate in the ways that you need to. Uh, if you think about what muscle fibers are and this unique combination of muscle and fat integrated within each other, thinking about like a ribeye steak, that is not easy to do. Uh, you know, you had to control pathogens. Uh, <laughs> so there's like all these things that um, you know, to be a little bit, a little bit flippant about it. I mean, like at the end of the day, like a cow is the end product of three and a half billion years of evolution. So it's kind of hard to replicate that in like five years in a lab, right? It's, there's a lot of technical challenges there. Um, and, and that's part of the challenge currently with that industry is like, how do you get the right growth factors to truly shock those cells out of senescence to get them to differentiate, to get them to grow and replicate, um, yeah, because that's that's challenging. And then what kind of environment do you need to have on and on and on, right? You're going to need to use a lot of electricity to provide all those all those services that I just listed of the heat, the nourishment, everything else. Um, and, that, and that's the last key point I'll say is like, you're not escaping, you're not escaping the laws of thermodynamics, if that makes sense, right? Like you still have to feed the cells, amino acids and nutrients and, you know, minerals and everything else, which you would in the animal as well. So I, I never really understand the sustainability benefit of lab grown meat because you're not escaping anything that already exists within the bovine animal itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, it you're, does. That's actually yeah. really helpful to like yeah. lay it out like that. Yeah. I want to wrap it up by saying it like, to me, it just makes no sense. Like yeah. I want to, <laughs> you're like putting it eloquently and scientifically. And I want to just be like, Cause it makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a great technology. Like if we're going to like regrow like livers for people yes. or something like that, yeah. super cool bio biomedical, it makes a whole lot of sense. I don't like, I, you know, I've read some articles of like, well, we're going to grow like dog food with it. It's like, that is such an incredible investment to grow like uh, cheap stuff. No, that doesn't make any economic sense. So yeah. uh, we'll see where that, that industry goes. I may be completely wrong, but I, I, I just don't see it basically ever happening. Yeah. Okay. So I want to take the conversation to a new place. I feel like we spent a, a good chunk of this time talking about like the importance and what we're doing right and good things about agriculture uh, to be the devil's advocate or the bear bad news. We do have like a slight carbon footprint, right? Like we are contributing. There are things we could be doing better. Um, and I want to spend time on that. Like what, um, cause I feel like a thing, I mean, I focus in Tara, we can maybe delve into, you know, how this affects dairy or where you want to move this forward. But <clears throat> coming from my standpoint, I spend a lot of time with the carbon methane discussion. And then I spend a lot of time explaining that like methane is yes. While it's more has Dr. Mittlerner says it furious. It's also fast. So then I explain that in conversation. And then I get to the point where like, well, what are you guys actually doing then to lower the emissions? And so I would like to kind of delve into if you have any information about the future of additives and feed and just kind of things that what the future looks like for producers that we're actually working on to lower our footprint so that we can hit that, you know, carbon neutrality that we're saying like, um, or climate neutrality that we're saying that's possible for agriculture to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that that's right. And I think that's kind of related to your guys' other questions. I think that's the other thing is just painting a better future of like, well, where do we want to go, right? We want to be, we want to get better. We want to try to lower our footprint. So there's there's kind of a couple different ways to think about this. One is like, um, what I would say is kind of like how we have been making progress, which is like indirect improvements, meaning like as we've gotten better and as we've gotten more productive, like we have fewer cattle to produce the same amount of nutrition, for example, for people. And that actually helps lower our carbon footprint, the total greenhouse gas emissions per unit of production. So that's something that has been going on. Um, and that's a great example of how, you know, improvements in animal husbandry, animal health, genetics, nutrition of animals, um, things that you do because they make business sense or because they're really important to take care of the animals actually have environmental benefits over time, right? So that's kind of the indirect bucket, if you will. And then your question really is like, okay, well, what are these direct interventions that we what we have, right? And this is kind of the exciting part of, okay, if we if we can tackle methane, what are the different ways we can do it? And so there's kind of two main buckets, right? On the dairy side, we have significant amounts of manure methane that are released. And so manure management technologies to try to reduce methane emissions is something that's already happening. And I think a, a great, great example of where um, innovation is taking place to try to lower methane emissions totally from the industry, if that makes sense, like the total amount that get emitted, not just emissions per unit of milk or beef. On the animal side, though, this is where it gets tricky, right? So we've said cattle are ruminants, and what that really means is they um, have this super cool digestive system. Uh, a dairy cow or a beef cow, I mean, they can have a, a stomach volume that's basically 40 to 50 gallons, right? It's like the size of your bathtub. And it's filled with trillions and trillions of microorganisms. And those microorganisms, they break all that feed down. Again, they unlock that solar energy. And then there's a certain class of those microbes called methanogens that, as the name kind of implies, they generate methane. Um, they're an essential part of that whole room and ecosystem because they actually take the waste products of some of the other microbes um, and keep the whole system running, if that makes sense, right? They're kind of like the waste, the waste handlers, if you will, right? The waste management. Um, and so that's one of our, our key challenges is like, okay, how do we try to lower methane emissions, but then not also disrupt room and fermentation, right? So it's kind of a balancing act there that we're trying to do. And so there are different ways we can do that. One thing that we do in the, the beef cattle industry is when we, we finish cattle on a higher starch diet or a grain-based diet, we actually lower methane emissions. That's something that's not necessarily well understood by a lot of folks, but you can basically have the methane emissions per unit of feed intake uh, by feeding them a grain-based diet as compared to when they're out grazing. And that just comes down to the different uh, microbes that are supported in the, in the rumen. And that's partially why animals that are in a feed yard, they, they gain weight more efficiently because they're losing less feed energy as methane. And that's, that's the key thing. Uh, methane emissions as they get emitted from the animal are actually just a loss of feed energy, loss of feed calories. So that's some of the stuff that we, we know what we can do now we're currently doing is changing their diets. Um, we know that fat can lower methane emissions, but that's a little bit of a delicate dance because ruminants actually need a low fat diet, right? So there's a certain threshold that we can feed. And then if we get beyond that, we cause issues with rumen fermentation. What's exciting is there are new feed additives that can lower uh, methane emissions. Um, so in particular, there's one called 3-nitroxypropanol, kind of a mouthful. It's marketed by DSM. It's a um, commercially known as Bovair. And so it's been approved in Europe and in Chile and Brazil. Um, and not that I can say too much about it, but the, in, the, in the US, Alenco just, we announced a strategic partnership with them to uh, work on commercializing Bovair here in the US. Um, so I think that's super exciting because um, that molecule has over 40 studies behind it in terms of what its effect is on methane emissions. And it works quite consistently in terms of lowering those, those methane emissions by specifically targeting an enzyme in the whole process. So that's one key opportunity. Uh, another one that folks probably have heard of is the seaweed, right? Uh, Dr. Cabrera but at UC Davis has done a lot of work on that. Um, that works by a similar principle in terms of it actually impacts the methanogenesis process or the methane generating process. Um, and has a lot of potential there too. And there's just questions about the consistency of the effect, mainly because you're dealing with a, a natural substance. And so there can be some variability in the content of the active ingredient in the seaweed. 
And it's a specific type of seaweed. So just the cultivation and delivery of it to um, animals, right? But those are things that we can, we can work on, we can overcome. So I guess I would say it's like a lot of it is we need the good research, we need the technical capability, and then most importantly, we need the economic incentives to make any of this make sense for producers, right? Um, because there's all sorts of things we could do, but if all it does is just add costs to folks that are already price takers, in my opinion, that is 100% not sustainable, right? So we need to really think through that, that whole process of how do we create a good system that basically um, solves this environmental challenge and gives us this opportunity to be a part of the climate solution, you hear a point, right? If we can lower methane, there's a, a bigger bang for your buck immediately from a temperature response perspective. So that's great. But we got to do it in ways that make economic sense too. I'm so okay. glad you said that because I just, I think in so many of the sustainability conversations, the not with producers, but more with consumers, the uh, financial side, the economic portion of sustainability um, gets lost in translation. So I'm glad we yeah. touched on that. Yeah. It is criteria number one, right? In reality, right? Yeah. your business is no longer in business and it's not sustainable. So yeah. Yep. So I have a couple of questions. Is the methan- methanogenesis process, is that kind of where the main focus is in scientific research right now? Is that where like a lot of time is being spent is in that area of like tweaking to have the results we want? So yeah, there is a lot more research that's happening there and there's there's some new initiatives out there to try to put more funding in it, into it. But I'll say actually one of the things, kind of my pet peeve of coming from academia and everything else is for all the conversation that we're having about this topic of sustainability, if you look at the actual funding available to researchers to tackle this, it is not commensurate, right? It is not even close. So I think that's one of the other key things this conversation is to advocate for um, making sure because this is such a, if you will, and so important to the public, well, you know, we got to invest in this stuff, right? Otherwise, we're just going to be talking about things and talking until we're blue in the face and having these arguments. It's like, but we're not actually, you know, making any progress. So I think that's super important is that we need to make sure we're investing in this. The industries have done a good job, right? And I think the, the dairy and the beef industries have provided leadership, but some of it is just the research funding and making sure researchers at land grant universities have the right funding to, to get this stuff done. So that actually brings me into a question that I had. Um, I know on the dairy side, like we set some really big goals for the future. And one of the main benefits I think of that is for us to stand up and say, we set these goals, like who wants to get on board with helping us? And, you know, Nestle um, committed to 10 million, the food foundation and agriculture grant that I think I forget the acronym. Far, far. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, they committed to 10 million. And so by setting goals, like the hope was to get more funding, to do more research, to actually make this happen. Do you see that happening like in dairy as well as in beef, like that making a difference in getting funding to the universities that need it? I think it definitely does make a difference, right? And um, I think the key thing, and, and this is me with my scientist hat on, is also we just need, we need, the funds for basic research to do some of this work as well, right? Because the reality is research, sometimes it works the way you want and then usually it usually doesn't. So, and you you learn along the way, right? So I think the key thing is these type of targeted funds to go to specific projects are really beneficial, but we also need, we also need that funding for basic research to come up with new products that we haven't even thought of yet, right? Um, But, but we can do these things, right? So I'm super, I guess I would say I'm super bullish on the trajectory that the industry is on, whether it's the dairy industry or the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef just announced their goals last week. Um, So I I think there's there's a lot of momentum right now. People are taking this seriously, and I think we're going to see a lot lot happening. And I I just think that these are solvable things, right? Like from a human ingenuity standpoint, we can do this. It's just making sure that we're dedicated and that we put the right funding behind it to get it done. Okay. So we have about 15 minutes left, which to me uh, feels like we have like one more (laughs) time to discuss one more topic, which is, I feel like we're going to have to have you on for a part two, (laughs) Um, because the way I would like to end this conversation is um, again, I'm going to put you on the spot to like, let's narrow it down the best you can to give our listeners a nice, pretty packaged bow present. Um, But it's a, it's the same question, but twofold answers. If you were on stage, which you are a lot, um, and you had a room full of producers in front of you, 
what is like the key points you would want them to put in their pocket to bring to this discussion about beef and sustainability? And then on the opposite side of the coin, if you had a room full of consumers that were, you know, concerned about beef and sustainability, what would the key topics you would want to say to them? And maybe it's the same answer. Maybe you would give the three list, but I'm curious, like, what do you want producers to know? And what do you want consumers to know? Mm. Yeah, I think it is pretty similar, but um, maybe framed a little bit different, right? So for, for producers, I think it is kind of reminding us of those, those things that we've talked about, right? At the end of the day, I really think we should focus on the, the key value proposition for cattle, right? Why do we do what we do? Because we take human inedible plants, things that we can't eat or don't want to eat, and we make a higher value product from it. Uh, both the beef and dairy industry make two times more protein for the human food supply than they use. And that is the fundamental reason why we have cattle. And in addition to that, we know we have challenges that we can work on. We're about a 2% contribution on the beef side. Uh, well, yeah, 3.7% 3, 3 if you look at it from a life cycle perspective and, and about 2% for dairy on a life cycle perspective to greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a huge opportunity for us to also do our part, even though it's a small contribution, to try to lower those emissions as well. So I think the key thing is just, why do we have cattle? Because they do this awesome stuff. Uh, we know we're not perfect and we're gonna keep working on it. Um, and for, for, for cattle producers, I think it's just for them emphasizing and, and highlighting that they should be super comfortable in having these conversations because it's what they do every single day, right? Um, in terms of, what they focus on with animal health, taking care of the land, being a good community member, that is sustainability. They're living and breathing it. Um, it's just talking about it in a different way. And for consumers, it's, it's again, the same message is just addressing their concerns and whether it's pulling up the specifics of, you know, the, the grocery store walk around conversation is always a good one, right? To highlight those interconnections um, and highlight the things that have been done and the exciting goals that the beef and dairy industries have set, right, to, to achieve greenhouse gas or climate neutrality uh, in the future. I love that. I loved the very last statement you said about what producers, like our entire reason for creating Elevate Ag was to help producers tell this story, to advocate for themselves and what they do, their lifestyle. Um, and just that was so well said. So thank you for sharing that. Um, there is a couple questions in the chat. Can we answer those oh. really quickly? Um, no, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned bison. Which no, I was, they're not important. <laughs> We're, done. <laughs> We're done. That's it. It's 8.50. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask the same question, so I'm glad I got asked. I always bring up the bison conversation that, like you said, if we decided to go back to the way things were, we would still introduce ruminant animals. It would be bison. Um, and yeah, there were 60 million bison at the peak uh, in the United States. So is that like a comparable, like our dairy and beef cattle pretty much producing what bison or like, what does that comparison look like? Yeah. So it's a question that comes up a lot, right? And one of the challenges is, of course, we didn't have like a USDA survey of all the bison. <laughs> so we don't know how many bison there were, right? Or all the wild ruminants. Um, there was a study that was done over a decade ago now by Dr. Alex Herstoff down at Penn State, where he looked at that and said, okay, based on what we know of the range of bison, all the other wild ruminants that were around basically pre-European colonization, um, how much methane did they emit compared to today? And so he looked at basically a low, medium, high bison assumption in terms of population and the medium assumption, which I think was around 60 million, um, plus all the other wild ruminants was about 87% of the equivalent amount of methane that comes from U.S. cattle today. So pretty close to the amount. His high scenario was actually more methane emissions than gets emitted from uh, domestic ruminants today. So it's probably somewhere close, right? Yeah. We kind of made a swap. Obviously, there was uh, that was not good in terms of what happened to the bison in 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 the North America. Um, but it also makes sense, kind of back to the short-lived nature of methane discussion. And that's why when there were so many wild ruminants, or if we think about the wild ruminant herds in Africa and other places, that's why those animals aren't necessarily causing out of control global warming, right? Because it's roughly in balance with the rate of destruction of methane in the atmosphere, right? So. That's really the key thing is the concern with methane is, are we increasing emissions? We don't want to increase emissions. We want to try to keep them stable or decline them. Um, that's what, that's what, how we're going to be able to do our part from a climate perspective. I know when I had this conversation with Dr. Mitloner, he kind of said, <clears throat> he gave me the statistics that there were 
60 million bison, 40 million like antelope or like other, as you kind of mentioned, I, don't, I guess I don't know what all in there. Um, so he roughly gave like a hundred million. And then he said, you know, now currently we're at 90 million beef and 9 million dairy. So again, roughly like a hundred million and so I know that in our conversation, he was talking about at least from a methane emission release standpoint to argue where that difference is. It's not coming from ruminants. It's coming from other man-made. Yeah. Uh, to to uh, be fair, obviously yeah. the way we manage manure with domestic ruminants is a lot different than the landscape situation. So really all this conversation we've just been having, that's really enteric methane only, right? If we want to be fair. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's hard to point, especially the last 30, 40 years, it's hard to point to cattle in the U.S. as a major driver of the global increase in methane emissions. I mean, that's just reality, right? Um, if we look at all the different sources, it's not ever increasing. So it's hard to be like, you know what, that's, that's a key source. That said, right, if we lower our emissions, we basically create space, if you will, in the methane budget. So it's important to do what we, Absolutely. What we need to do, but yeah, yeah probably no, I- not, not. Yeah, exactly. It's not their main driver. Yeah. And, and that goes back to, you know, the portion that is our responsibility, our uh, manure management, like that was, mm-hmm. you know, there is parts that we can do to be, that's, that's our part. That's what we need to change is manure management. Um, there was and one of, oh, sorry, sorry go ahead. before we go on to the other one, I think that's important too. Cause I feel like when we come into conversations um, to not always, I guess I'm speaking to like producers that will be listening to this to not always be so defensive as like, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, and like pointing the finger back. I always try and be like, this is what we're doing well. And yes, kind of exactly what you said, uh, Sarah, like, yes, we have stuff to work on and we're aware of that and we're working on it. Like, but the big picture is like right now we are more positive than we are negative and we're trying to fix our negative. But I feel like if we have conversations where we always just leave out our negative, that doesn't look very credible, like, or good on us as an industry either. Yep. That's correct. Um, thank you for dropping the bison paper in there. There's also a question. Do you have any sources, articles related to the emissions for grain-based diets? If you have that, that would be great. Or if there's and just in we, general, if there's a few articles that you love that we could, I will to. actually, we'll give you time to do that. Um, Sarah, I want to call you Dr. Place. <laughs> I want to call you Sarah and I want to call you Dr. Call me, Place. Call me Sarah. Call you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the middle, like fumbling over what I'm calling you. Um, we are going to send out actually, cause, um, we send out these recordings to our email list for everyone to view at their own time. And then we're actually going to turn them into our blog post as well. So, um, well, you can just email those to us and we can include those in the the email we send out at a later date so that you have a little bit of time to, you're not put on the spot, like rapidly Googling right now. Yeah. Yeah. But if there's, yeah, if you'll email Natalie and I will add those as well of just some great sources and follow her on Twitter. Her Twitter is like a just a, so much amazing resources. You do such a great sh- job. Like you make producers jobs easier by being able to go to your Twitter and be like, okay, what's Dr. Place sharing today? What's she talking about? Okay. Yes. I can apply that to my farm and share it to my community and get that information out there. I'll put it for everyone listening. It is, um, at D R S P L A C E. So Dr. S place. And I'll put that in the chat for the people are here, but, um, for people who are listening later on, it's at Dr. S place. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for carving out time to spend with us and our community this morning. Um, we may have to have you back later on because I feel like there was stuff we didn't get to. Um, and like Tara said, this is you and Mitt Loner and everyone else who is doing your job at your guys' level. Like we have to be working together and together is how we make the change. Like you guys are doing the research, you're pumping out the scientific information for us as producers then to bring it to our community and the mass generation. So I love that we're like working together to get all this information like agriculture has at their fingertips that for some reason I feel like historically has kind of just been, I don't know where it's been hiding, but it, <laughs> it hasn't been getting out. So thank you for helping us bring it out, you know, shed light on it in a, in a bigger, with a bigger spotlight. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. It's been great. Went fast. And then it did go fast. Are you speaking at, I know you had, um, you were on part of the pre-panel for the Animal um, Alliance in Kansas next week. Are you at the actual conference? Like, um, I'm not. Okay. I was going to say, I'm just going to give another resource for people to like, who want to hear you talk further. Um, But okay. But you are, you did a pre-webinar with them. So if you're part of the Animal Ag Alliance, you can listen to her pre-webinar that just got released yesterday. So. I think that's, that was in my email yesterday. So. Yeah. It was, it was a panel with three Dr. Sarah's. So it got a little confusing, but yeah. Oh my gosh. 
That's hilarious. <laughs> it was a very popular name in the mid eighties. So. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah, right. Well, awesome. thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Everyone enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and we will come back um, next week for, is it next week or the next week? It's our next webinar. Next week after that, we have one um, okay. on. Yep. Well, we'll share that all in the email list. So everyone have a good day. Thank you. And Sarah, thank you. Again. Thank you again. Bye. Bye-bye.